Ah. What an introduction. That's beautiful. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, so we are climate VCs. So we're climate VCs. <laughs> we're positive VCs, which is even better. Yeah. Because we're here to talk about climate positive investment. And so, David, why did you go up to investing in climate? Yeah, so uh, I'll tell you that. So I was worrying about climate like everyone else like 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I forgot about it because I was really busy running my company. Um, and that was uh, a success in some ways. Um, and then I, uh, what I really liked about running my own company was that, you know, I had a lot of different teams doing cool shit, and I could right. run around to them and talk to them and inspire them right. and, and give them money, you know, to do more <laughs> shit. Um, but also, I liked, you know, Unity is a very st strategic company, and it's sort of a, there's a grand strategy to running Unity. You know, we're engaging with all the platforms and the devices and the developers and all the different stuff. Um, and I love that grand strategy. So when I came out of Unity, I was doing angel investing, and I was investing in all these little teams. And I got the team kick, you know, just talking to all these clever people. But there was no grand strategy, because every startup was like a different thing, and they were all cute and awesome. Um, but I missed that. And then I was in investing in a lot of companies, and I came across uh, somebody who was actually already a friend, Pia Henrietta, yep. of, uh, of Carpo Culture. And, you know, friends were investing in her company, so I just kind of invested with them. I wasn't really thinking too much about what she was up to. Um, but then she and, and a few other climate uh, kind of founders, climate tech founders I, I met and invested in, started educating me about um, the problem, which I knew a little bit about, and the solutions, which I knew almost nothing about. Um, and I found it so damn inspiring and fun. And I'm, I'm sort of, I'm almost embarrassed by how fun it is <laughs> working. Because in climate, there is a grand strategy. Everything is connected to absolutely everything. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I basically got a kick out of it. Um, then I realized that I should, you know, focus my life a bit. And I decided to build an actual venture fund uh, so we could deploy, like, way more money than I sort of would otherwise have. And when you thought about that, with your experience of being a founder and so therefore VC funded, uh, did you just go for going plain vanilla VC <laughs> classic or did you not have anything, you know, from so, your VC experience that you really wanted to change? Yeah, so I really, I'm one of those people that had a very good experience with venture capital. <laughs> you know, I've had fantastic partners, Sequoia Capital, you know, Silver Lake, the best of the best, DFJ, you know, um, awesome partners. Um, and my, when I was disaligned with my investors, it was on, over minor things, and you know, half the time, more than half the time, they were right anyway. Um, so I learned to kind of love that really. And uh, and uh, as we we're thinking about, you know, okay. So what I did mention is that in my angel investing, I invested in like 20 climate tech companies, right. from, from like small reactors to new materials, you know, biotechnology, and all these interesting things. Um, so I got to know, you know, tens of founders and. Uh, as we, you know, the, the team is getting together, we're, we talked to over 100, you know, climate founders in the last six months, and I've, we, we came to believe that the current VC model is pretty damn good, um, and, and it's also very sellable to the institutional, you know, money holders. Um, so the conclusion is, yes, let's extend the timeline of the fund a little bit to 12 years instead of 10, you know, plus extension. Um, but otherwise, you know, you, you know, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, they're doing 20-year funds. And, you know, we looked at it and we're like, that's just a number. <laughs> like, who's going to sit around for 20 years anyway? We don't have 20 years uh, to solve the crisis, right? So that's sort of, um, yeah, so, so far we're, we're going for something quite vanilla. I know you're not, so I really want to hear <laughs> kind of how you got into this and, and how you're doing it. Um, and maybe we'll end eventually, you know, copy you. But, uh, but yeah, that's where we are. Yeah. How about, you? How about you? How did you? So me in the in the grand scheme of things. Because you've actually been a VC for a while. I've been a VC for 21 years. Yep. So that's a long <laughs> time. So I've seen cities, I've seen kind of the limits of the VC model in all these times. And limits were pretty fun because the first limits I experienced was that we were not integrating um, digital tools within the way we were doing venture, mm -hmm. and even uh, digital culture or community-driven things. And, and it took a while, actually, for the VC industry but, but to integrate all that. That's over. So this is my first fun, basically, was all about that. How can we integrate 
and, and kind of adapt the VC model to the digital transi transition. What I, what I see now is that the transition we're living is not only about climate tech, it's basically a complete transformation of the economy that's going on towards a responsible net zero economy, yep. which is way deeper than what we've seen on digital even, and it's driven like digital transformation by people that changing their conceptions, habits, they're changing their requirement for work, looking for purpose in their work, changing also where they want to put their money, making sure their money is not harming society or the planet. And so it's really this change driven by people and this wave of transformation is like digital going to touch every sector in every geography in every company that needs to adapt. Yes. And so I see massive disruption opportunities, but I see also how the VC model has is not adapted as a product to that particular transition. One of the reasons being that you were talking about the grand scheme of things, if you want to accelerate market shifts, there's a number of nodes when you, and when you look at and deep dive into a sector or value chain, there are a number of these nodes that cannot be solved by companies. So for example, if you look at agriculture, mm -hmm. well, one thing that is preventing the agriculture model to be resilient to climate change and to adapt itself into regenerative practices is that it's not what farmers were taught at school. Is what? It's, it's not what farmers were taught at school. You have an education yeah. topic, mm -hmm. which is there's no shared knowledge today expressed within people that this is the case. We have regulatory issues around heirloom seeds, for example, which could be a great area of research to adapt new diets. Yeah. And these are not problems or not that can be solved by companies, but by research, education, advocacy. So basically open and strategic resources that we fund in parallel to ventures. So That's part really of the things we're doing is really having this ecosystemic view and saying, if you want to have kind of a, a, a true shift of a market, it can not only be driven by one particular company, but you really need to see where it hurts and how you can, with um, this kind of ecosystem power, try to make things move forward and accelerate that. And I love the fact that Elon Musk at Tesla, he gave away all Tesla patterns in 2013, which accelerated completely the transition towards electric cards. So he gave away for commons, common IP, yep. but it was also very beneficial for himself because he became the clear technological leader. That's really neat. Maybe we don't disagree that much because those other activities I sort of intend to fund basically out of side pocket. I mean, my own. Yeah, 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 pocket. exactly. Um, you know, so far, we, yeah, we started kind of transition labs where we're going to do a few activities. Uh, and hopefully be learning from you or even collaborating with you on no, that. No, but that's exactly it. I used to do these type of things aside, mm -hmm. like being part of France Digital, which is one of the uh, main France, uh, French uh, startup association, trying to do uh, more regulatory work to make it adapted to uh, startup growth and things like that, or attracting talents mm -hmm. to the startup company, sharing best practices. But I think we need to do it at a more systemic level. Yeah and to really make sure, because if you look at all these places, um, well, it's not only based on startups, it's also based on sectors, so this is why I thought we should really integrate it by design in the model, basically. Fantastic. It's going to be really exciting to see how it, how it plays out. <laughs> yeah, and when you say, you know, you were, how do you feel the investor base or founder base are sensitive to um, basically all these topics around climate change. Do they see when I talk about a transformation of the economy? And so meaning that this is disruption opportunities? I think, I think people are seeing it, right? Right. But, but I mean, just a few years ago, like some of these companies that are truly transformational and could have like gigantic impact, we could not get them funded for love or money. So it's just, you know, unbelievable companies were not getting funded and now they, now they are. So there's a real fast change, uh, which is wonderful. Um, is it a culture, ch what I've seen and experienced is that sometimes people, when you say that you're an impact-driven company or purpose-driven company, they believe you will not be financially focused or it will, it will entangle performance. Is that gone I, as a perception? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, yes, <laughs> I think it's completely gone. I think people can see that this gigantic you know, transition that all, all, of, yeah. all our systems have to go through. Uh, will drive incredible, like you know, value creation. Um, you know, we, we we were sort of looking at this, and we realized that 
you know, over the next 10, 15 years, like another 10 Tesla-sized companies can be built. Um, and, you know, then Bill Gates started saying that too. <laughs> so I think we agree on that. Um, and yes, I mean, venture capital, whether in the tr traditional way and, and definitely also in, in the way you're doing it, you know, can, can accelerate these transformations. Uh, and capture value from them, which is... Yeah, and the fact that you're also not funding the kind of same type of classic SaaS uh, companies, but also taking other type of risk, which could be industrial risk or very deep tech risks, or that are more capex intensive, for example, require more capital. Is that something you, you see both founders and investors being more comfortable with than, than a pure digital era? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, what, what we see is that when we go and talk to these, you know, climate founders, they really appreciate that, you know, people are coming in, building deep conviction, really analyzing the, you know, the, their sectors. I mean, there's a lot of sectors, obviously, um, and, you know, trying to pick, pick, pick winners and, and, and accelerate them. Um, you know, traditional VCs aren't here. Yep. I mean, they're, they're showing up for some deals, and that's great. And, you know, we compete with them, we collaborate with them as, as usual. Um, but, yeah, like, you know, groups with, you know, conviction, with expertise that will actually go down and ask the right questions of the, in, of, of the founders and not weird questions. Um, I, think, I think, you know, we'll both be appreciated in that. Absolutely. And I know that in the 2050 team, we had to acquire this diversity of expertise as yeah. well. And the fact that we do invest in these strategic comments, when you talk to people that are experts in their particular sector, it's actually, um, you have a very different relationship to them than when you just come to ask for advice in funding that particular company, because you're not asking for advice to make yourself richer, but really to understand how you can help the whole solving the problem at a global level and helping research progress, helping um, knowledge to be shared, helping open data models or things like that. So it completely changed the relationship you have and therefore the type of um, re relationship even for the startups you fund mm -hmm. within the different type of actors in the ecosystem. Yes. And I've been suffering um, from the fact that innovation systems have been so much siloted, like researchers not talking that much to startups uh, founders or to corporates or that we haven't um, succeeded in making all these cooperation schemes happen and that we need those today. Yep. And so I feel it's coming up a little bit because of this transformation that we know we need to work together. And so that's super inspiring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is good. Yeah, and, and yeah, as we, as we talk to these founders, I think there's sort of a few things we realize. One is that they actually really appreciate, you know, this kind of yeah, conviction-driven group. They, they want to be connected to each other because these companies and founders yep. have a lot to say to each other. Yep. Some only for learning and inspiration, for some for actual collaboration. Um, and then there's some stuff that, you know, traditional VCs either don't do or actively dislike, like project financing, understanding yep. alternative ways of financing, because a lot of these companies will have to build, you know, installations and machines and yep. reactors and so on. Um, so that's something, you know, I think we can help, help them with. That means we will also need, on a financial pers uh, angle, to drive links with really different type of players like these guys who are funding infrastructure projects yep. or debt players and try to enlarge our thinking into more diverse funding strategies. The cool thing is there's so much of that money. I mean, everyone <laughs> uh, all, all over, like, you know, these big capital funds that are deciding, you know, it needs to be green, right? Right. They're 10% green, 20% green, and then they have all this money sitting around and it's not necessarily finding good places. We can, we can help with that. Hmm. One of the things I see as well is that when you've lived through the digital transformation, at the beginning of it, there were no, no best practices to share between companies. Yeah, yeah. Because you didn't know at that time what it meant to be a job, to be data-driven, or to be any of these kinds of stuff. So we built the best practice, the, we built the playbook. Mm -hmm. And what I see today is that companies, not only you need to solve the problems, but you need to not create more problems, right? Sure. 
So we really are fond of Probably smaller problems than the ones you solve. Yeah, if you're solving this, but you're creating new ones here, I mean, you're yeah, not not working. <laughs> so therefore, if you really want to build a sustainable model, um, you need companies who are aligning their business interests with those of society and both of the planet. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy to say, um, but it's super hard to do. You know, and because also we live in a system that is pushing for mis misalignment, we're, we're favoring basically business interests over the rest. Yeah. And I love to quote Reed Hastings on this. So Reed Hastings from Netflix. Say so again. Reed, ha Reed Hastings yeah, yeah. from Netflix. He says, "My biggest competitor is sleep." Right? Or he even says, "My greatest enemy." And the day he said, I read that actually in an interview, and I just had finished the book Why We Sleep from Matthew Walker, where he explains how much just having 15 minutes of sleep less at a population level is so hard on public health. It, it drives public health issues like more depression, more cardiovascular accidents, more car accidents, more whatever, because health is the number one factor of people. And where is that? Can you see? Well, oh, so this is misalignment, basically, when you're pushing your whole company's interests into going against society's interests. So, this alignment, I think, we don't know how to do yet. So, this complete transformation of the economy, and so we we need to share the best practice because we need to establish them. We have no playbook of that. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, we have no playbook of how you actually are. Lim having so good behaviors in terms of regenerating the planet or in terms of, so it's starting, like we have topics like diversity and inclusion, we have several topics there, but really trying to find a, um, kind of examples of what company did, even in terms of governance, you know, and how you can make sure that you're not only governed by financial interests, but you also have some stewards who can preserve the mission, for example, or things like that. The good, is, the good thing is these, these companies are human systems, right? And Absolutely. I mean, at least, you know, the people we meet are mostly true believers. Yeah. Right? They really want to do good stuff. Yeah. I'm not sure. I wonder even how important you know what what the bylaws say is compared <laughs> to like the fact that they're true believers. Yeah, and company culture and incentives. If you only have you know business people's incentives based on yeah, well, it comes down to that. You know, right. how do you drive your company? Obviously, it goes from it comes from governance. If at the board level you're only looking at financials and you're not. Talking wanna, about anything else is a problem. Are you working on like example bylaws or like practical like implementation oh. details like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. So we're working on. We're how not, but I mean, maybe we should. No, we are. Huh? We are, and even for us as a company, we were we asked ourselves, how can we have, how can we align ourselves, right, as a VC? And we, when you look at the VC model, you are saying the product works. Yes, it works to create certain type of companies, but we also do believe it's framing the strategy of companies in a certain way, mm. and it does have misalignment uh, de by design. Mm. To give you an example, the, the, so what we've done is to, to completely align the financial incentives of general partners, of, so the investors who invest in the companies, on the value of the ecosystem it creates, so on the performance of the fund. And therefore, we got rid of any financial incentive at the management company level by giving away all the shares to a perpetual purpose trust. So it's, it's like the Nordic Shareholding Foundation uh, model, where basically all, all our management company is held by a trust, mm -hmm. and we get no financial incentive at that level. We're only incentivizing the performance of the fund and salary, obviously. Sorry, why is that important? Because if you... So at the Manco level, yeah. there's a partnership, mm -hmm. and the shares of the management company are completely linked to uh, the assets under management, for example, which is not the same strategy optimizing assets under management than optimizing performance of the fund. Okay. And it's not shared throughout all the team, mm -hmm. so it also creates misalignment between the team, mm -hmm. potentially. Yeah. And it's the one place where there's only the team who has interest of optimizing that particular value. The rest of the ecosystem doesn't benefit from any of that. Sure. So we got rid of that particular thing. Me? And therefore we have a steward ownership. And so that drives all discussions around board governance, right? And around how you can 
align yourself completely as a company and by still maintaining the good financial incentives. We need both, right? Yeah, yeah. But by, by not having things that are pushing you in different directions and that are creating at a personal level very strong misal potentially misalignments. Hmm. Neat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's actually also inspired by, because at, this is basically as, as having a big board. Uh, no, it's, yeah. ju it's just like a, a governance body and that's voting the budget and making sure that uh, you, you're, you're, you're taking the right business decisions, but also not changing your mission, for example, or without uh, having stewards looking and saying, yes, this is the right way of doing things. Um, and when you're giving away all these chairs and you're giving this power to people and to your board, you're asking yourself, you know, who are the people that I want to give this power to? Sure. I find this really weird. I don't like big boards, you know. I, I don't like boards in early stage companies. I do believe in, in yeah. that when your ecosystem governed, because this is what we did. Yeah, yeah. We didn't give, we have zero independent board member. It's really people who are part of what we're doing and who have different angles to what we're doing sure. and who are making this decision together. So founders that we finance, but LPs who put money in the fund and the team and all that. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a consensus. It's not a consensus, it's a majority of 15 people, which is a big board. But still, I really believe we need to think You're about saying, more decentralized 15, one five. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. No, 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 no. That, that no. <laughs> <my bad> <laughs> that no, uh -uh. So, I mean, 15 is already too many. Uh, well, if you want to build more decentralization, which uh, I feel we need, and more diversity in decisions. You decision, can crowd surf on 15 people, right? You cannot, sorry? You can crowd surf on 15 people. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, so I think it's important that you have kind of a diversity as well that is explored at that level. Mm -hmm. So part of the stewards, we have uh, Rashi Sumaila, who's a researcher in Vancouver, and he's one of the biggest specialists of fish reads, mm -hmm. for example. And so having that partly insight and culture in yeah. the company, it makes you aware when you have this ecosystemic view of, uh, it makes you feel you're not... Um, I can see how it anchors you to all these industries. Beautiful thing. That's really. Yeah. Cool. I, I actually, that I would appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> I know you thought about this <laughs> also more than me. <laughs> I know. Cool. I'm doing that. Did um, you put like a kind of a north star, something like that? It's to help humanity transition, you know, to the new to the new world. And this is, I mean, you know, this is going to be better shit. You know, cleaner, quieter, prettier. You know, it's going to be really good when we get there. And how do you make sure you're not creating other monsters? Hmm. It's a good question. I don't have a good answer. Hmm. I think uh, I think we're thoughtful. I think we, you know, we want to look at, you know, we want to find people that are true believers. You know, I don't think any of, I mean, no, none of the founders we meet are not true believers, or they're quickly, you know, weeded yeah. out. I mean, I don't even think we take a meeting with them. You can feel it from, you know, through email that people aren't really there. Um, I'm such a believer in humans that I, I, think, I think that's enough. I'm a believer in humans as well, but I think we're living in a system that is pushing you naturally sure. to misalign. And this is why I, I really f try to think into how can we design something that naturally is kind of a bringing you back yeah. um, by design because, yeah. yeah. No, I, I see what you mean. And maybe, maybe, maybe I'll you know, <laughs> be all that bitter soon <laughs> and realize that I was too optimistic. Um, that's a good point. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I mean, when you, it, it was funny because at some point I, I was discussing with the... Um, Europe, uh, it's going to sound out of... Uh, it's a different... Well, it's in the topic, but it's a different angle to it. I was talking to European Commission at some point, and they were discussing about the abuse of, it, that was years ago, um, even before we had the whistleblower on Facebook and all that. And they were talking about um, how, uh, what can we do about Facebook, right? And, and some of them, well, Mark Zuckerberg should be in jail. I was like, what type of law did he 
uh, for, you know, w w what did he do yeah. that is not compliant to law, yeah. right? If you really believe that what he did was so wrong, then why did the law didn't, why, why are you not changing the law? Sure. Right? And so that's what I'm saying, is that within the borders and within the system, because you are incentivized to optimize profit all the time and the rest is not valued, you're pushed to that direction and that's perfectly legal and fine. Mm -hmm. So if we don't value the rest at the same level, if we don't put rules that are making us stay maintain compliance, how do we maintain that? How do we change it? No? I get it. <laughs> I, yeah, it's funny because I'm pretty pessimistic about capitalism in general. <laughs> pessimistic or optimistic? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's a monster, right? I just, yeah. uh, I just always, uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I, I've, I've maintained the belief that sort of, you know, tech and, and, and venture could, could, could remain on the good side. Um, and I find that easy to believe because of the founders I meet that are so driven and passionate. Yeah, and I agree. Um, but I see what you're And I agree. Uh, I agree. And, and so how bad do you think the transition is going to be? Bad? Yeah. Huh. Like for civilization. So the more, I think for, so I've been digging into this a lot, mm -hmm. uh, understanding the IPCC scenarios, the cycle of carbon, because you can act upon what you understand, right? And this is uh, one of the reasons that one of the, well, whatever. So I've been really digging into that and culture as well, and things do not look good at all. Um, this is part of the reason that I think, you know, changing finance, which is a matrix, is super important because then you have a kind of a network effect and doing what you do is super important because, as you're saying, we don't have that much time and we will need both to limit and adapt mm -hmm. because it's already there, so we absolutely need to adapt already. Yep. Then what I really see is that when you're acting upon it and you're meeting, as you're saying, when you're saying, I meet all these great founders, you're having so positive energy around all this, right? That it makes it easier and it makes it faster as well because all this energy combined. Yep. Um, but the point where I see more um, sadness is when you kind of don't want to see it uh, and are in a personal denial about it. Or in France, we say, in France, I'm French, so in France we say uh, dissonance cognitive, so cognitive, cognitive dissonance, dissonance is the same yeah. in English, and where you're at a personal level completely misaligned. Yeah. So I think it can be a, um, a cause that is a lot of people and that is creating a lot of positive energy and joy in trying to find solutions and I'm a positive person so this is why when building 2050 we started by saying our mission is to create a fertile future you know what there can be a fertile future mm -hmm. and even the even the, the, the same simple thinking about that and trying to identify what it could be and how we can build it is super important because you're driving energy in a common direction and you're entertaining or, or nurturing it, that energy. Yep. And one of the things I did when I started 2050, because I, I, I knew that we needed to fix some words, give some words about that future, mm -hmm. and that a better word doesn't mean anything because it will mean something different for you, for me, for anybody in the room. And it just means it's great, it's better than yesterday. It doesn't mean it's good, it doesn't mean it's fair, it doesn't mean it's sustainable or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And when usually when whatever you see around you that is projected towards the future is anxiety, you know, artificial intelligence and robots are gonna kill our jobs, climate change is gonna be horrible, blah, blah, blah. And there's nothing around what is the type of society we could wish for and we want to work for and we want to contribute to. And this is why I thought it was very important to put some words on that and to design the vision of what it could be. And because it drives and it designs an investment strategy that is ecosystemic where you can do all this kind of uh, decline of this uh, common strategy. 
And the interesting thing is that I tried to see if there was some culture where the projection on the future was positive. Hmm. Yeah. Right? So I read a lot of science fiction. Yes. I read Chinese science fiction, US science fiction, uh, European kind of science fiction, and African science fiction. Uh, did you agree that you learned more about the, the climate crisis from uh, the three-body problem than from most other books? Oh, yes, I did. It's unbelievable. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so the only positive, well, if I, if I can, had to do like a kind of a very simple, um, summary, which obviously is not very subtle, uh, about all the different things. Like, US projection of the future of US science fiction is that everything's in the space, technology rocks, and it's misery on Earth, right? Yep. Chinese is more, it's future is space, technology is going to save us, we're going to find other planets, blah, 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 as well. But on the planet, on Earth, it's just humans are kind of robots. It's not misery, it's just not very human. Mm -hmm. And if you look at France, well, France is super interesting because it's uh, kind of back to nature yeah. uh, thinking and very anti-tech potentially, but very much into we need to go back to uh, our combination and, and link to nature. The most interesting thing, Africa. After? African science fiction. Huh. Can you give us a title? Yeah, um, read Binti from Nnedi Orokwafor. What? Binti, that's the name of the book. Binti? And it's actually for, for teen, teenagers. Wow. It's creative fantasy. And it's super interesting because her, um, her hero, so she's born in Nigeria, but she lived in the US after, so it's kind of mixed culture still. Um, and she's really anchored in Earth, right? They belong, and they get energy, and they get power, and they belong, right? And, and, and they get really that very strong link to the planet. Mm -hmm. But they also have very strong cultural links to their um, community. They uh, inherited from that, right? And they're part of that, and they, you, you can see like what, they're also part of a society, right? And then it's super positive on technology and with this idea that in, you got this university in space where all the different cultures come and work all together to get and solve all the Earth problems and you're like, yes, I want that. Wow. I want that one, it, right? Yes. So, we, <laughs> so we need also, the only thing I'm telling this story is that we need a common narrative yes. that we all want to happen and I think it will be way better if we you won't be able to find that to one narrative, it. but maybe a few narratives, yeah, I agree. sort of a line or point in the same direction, yeah? And different ones. I mean, yeah, yeah. We, we, it's, it's fine not to have the same. I'm, I don't believe in one scenario. Oh, it can't yeah. work. No, no. Yeah. I think we're, we're out of time? I think we're run out of time, yeah. Huh. It's a pleasure. Really? Super pleasure. Thank you so much for talking. Thank you. To me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening.